Assalamu alaikum friends, welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be talking about Staphylococcus aureus. I've got a detailed video on Staphylococcus. If you've missed that, find this link in the description or maybe floating in the top right corner, then you'll have a great trip on today's video as well. But before starting the lecture, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcome in the comment section. So let's jump right into the video. Staphylococcus aureus. It is a gram-positive coxar. It has got two words in it. First one is staphylo, which means cluster, and second one is spherical. As you can see in this picture, these are spherical. Staphylococcus equals a bunch of grapes. As you can see, this one, it actually resembles a bunch of grapes. Staphylococcus aureus is facultative anaerobe, which means that it is aerobic and anaerobic at the same time, meaning that it can exist in the presence of oxygen and it can also exist in the absence of oxygen. It is a non-motile bacterium. Why? Because it has no motility apparatus like a flagella. It is catalase positive. For your information, all the three staph are catalase positive, but the staph aureus is the only one who is coagulase positive. So this is a test that is going to differentiate Staphylococcus aureus from the other two species of the Staphylococcus. Let's talk about the classification of Staphylococcus before proceeding further. It is classified into Staphylococcus aureus, which is the most common of all the three species. The second one is Staphylococcus epidermidis, and the third one is Staphylococcus saprophyticus. As I mentioned earlier, that Staphylococcus aureus will get a positive coagulase test to differentiate it from the remaining two Staphylococci. Lecture outline: As we are done with the introduction of Staphylococcus aureus now we'll be looking at its morphology then habitat transmission pathogenesis clinical findings lab diagnosis treatment prevention and at the end as usual we'll review the lecture morphology shape it is spherical round or berry like it is arranged in irregular grip like clusters just like that it is arranged in pairs or short chains like that its diameter varies from 0.5 to 1 micrometer and it is purple in color. You might be thinking, why is it purple in color? Because it's gram positive. So gram positive bacteria always stain pink or purple while the gram negative bacteria stain blue. I've got a detailed video on gram stain on my channel. Find its link in the description or maybe in the top right corner. Structure. As I mentioned earlier that Staphylococcus aureus has got no motility apparatus like flagella, but it has a capsule and this capsule is a polysaccharide capsule we also call it a micro cap let's talk about the cell wall and its components and antigens protein a tychoic acid surface receptors peptidoglycan I won't explain all of them in this video because it will take too long. I've got detailed videos on bacterial structure and staphylococcus. Watch those to have a great grip on these four antigens and components of cell wall. Then we've got the cell membrane. As you can see in this picture, there are some toxins that are released by this bacteria like toxic shock syndrome, toxin type 1, staphylococcal enterotoxins, alpha toxin. It has got its capsule just there, then its peptidoglycan layer then membrane and we've also got some enzymes and proteins like coagulase is an enzyme and this bacteria is positive catalase enzyme and there are some things that are present in the cell wall uh, of this bacteria like this lipotychoic acids if, if we zoom in this part of bacteria we'll see that it has got certain components in it like lipotychoic acids clumping factors fibronectin binding proteins collagen adhesins and lipoproteins habitat human beings are the main reservoirs Primary locations of Staphylococcus are skin and upper respiratory tract. In skin, specifically the nares, ears, pharynx, armpits, groin, and perineum. Transmission. Transmission occurs by hand contact, fomites, when you puncture, and devices like catheters, maybe a urinary catheter, or prosthetic devices like a prosthetic heart valve or a prosthetic joint, for example, hip joint, um, and some devices that can be left in for a long time, like surgical lap pads, tampons, and nasal packings. Surgical wounds may get into contact with the skin's normal flora, which contains the Staphylococcus aureus, and this may get access to bloodstream. Pathogenesis. Staphylococcus aureus is responsible for causing infection or damage by two main mechanisms or by two main things. Number one is biofilms. Number two is exotoxins. What is a biofilm? It is an aggregate of microorganisms in which cells adhere to each other in a surface. 
Um, there are certain developmental stages of a biofilm like initial attachment, irreversible attachment, then we've got mutation 1, mutation 2, and dispersion. Um, uh, let's talk about exotoxins. There are certain toxins that are released by different bacteria. Some will release endotoxins, but some will release exotoxins. For staph aureus, these are the exotoxins. Let's start talking about biofilms. Biofilms make an exopolysaccharide EPS layer. During venipuncture, bacteria from human skin flora get onto the needle, just like that. And with the help of needle, bacteria gain access to the vein and enters the bloodstream. As you can see, bacteria on the venous catheter start to secrete a loose polysaccharide layer around them in order to make the biofilm. Bacteria can now pass on genetic and cell signaling material. This thick polysaccharide covering is a biofilm and it awaits the antibiotics and leukocytes, CWBCs. It becomes difficult for antibiotics to treat infections as these biofilms can lead to catheter-associated infections. Here we are done with with the biofilms, now we are going to talk about the exotoxins. The first toxin released by Staph aureus is toxic shock syndrome toxin type 1. When Staph aureus enters the human body, it releases that toxin. It will then bind onto the connection between antigen-presenting cells and the T-cells having MHC2 complexes, as you can see just like that, and it will then act as a super antigen and hyper-stimulate their immune response and leading to a massive release of cytokines like interleukin-1, interleukin-2 tumor necrotic factor alpha and interferon gamma so what do you think these cytokines are going to do these cytokines act on the skin causing rash and inflammation so skin will get red as you can see just like that and then these cytokines will also increase capillary permeability that will lead to hypertension means low blood pressure they will also act on hypothalamus to increase the prostaglandin production that will lead to fever hypertension rash and fever these three will combine and will form what? Toxic shock syndrome. Then we have got the second exotoxin and that is leukocidin toxin. This toxin forms pores in white blood cells, the leukocytes. For example, I've got a neutrophil there and you can see these pores. These pores are formed by this leukocytin. That leads to ions influx and efflux. This causes what? This causes necrosis of the leukocytes, the white blood cells. When white blood cells die, it leads to massive amounts of inflammation. This is most common in lungs. If you look at this lung, it has got bacteria in different places. What happens, these bacteria will do this procedure in the lung and necrosis will occur in lungs. Whenever this inflammation occurs, it causes damage to parenchymal lung tissue and necrosis of some lung tissue cells. This is leading to what? Necrotizing pneumonia. Next one in the list is exfoliative toxin. Prior to explaining it, let me tell you what is this. These are the skin cells, the keratinocytes. This is a junction between the skin cells. This junction is normally quite hard to maintain our skin structure and there's a protein named desmoglein 1 present in it to maintain that structure. Exfoliative toxin destructs this desmoglein 1 between the keratinocytes as you can see there. After the damage, the connection between keratinocytes is lost just like that and now they are unable to stay together. Eventually, blisters forms and they slough off and lose skin from themselves. So this is called staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. This can be seen in kids aging less than six years. Fourth one in the list is hemolysin, the beta hemolysin toxin. These are the red blood cells. What happens? This toxin leads to destruction of red blood cells membrane. When membrane is destructed, hemoglobin, the beta hemoglobin, is released out of the cell and will get destroyed. Ultimately, what happens? Red blood cells destruction. For checking the hemolysin, the beta hemolysin, what we do, we put staph on blood agar and it destroys the blood. As you can see, this is a staph, this is the blood agar. And it leaves some empty spots there, which means that it is a staph aureus with its beta hemolysin exotoxin. So this process is called hemolysis or red blood cells destruction. The final toxin in the list is enterotoxin as the word entero is related to enteric which actually relates to our intestine or GI team it targets enterocytes within the epithelial lining of GI tract it produces different types of pores and dysfunctional proteins that will lead to destruction of cell membranes
membrane of enterocytes and will leak sodium and water. And what will happen, cells are destroyed and now they'll not be able to perform their normal function, which is to absorb nutrients, water and electrolytes. Ultimately, what will happen? This will lead to diarrhea, but in some places is also mentioned as food poisoning because food poisoning also involves diarrhea. As a result, there will be decreased absorption and electrolytes shift will occur and inflammation of GI lining which we term as gastroenteritis. This usually happens in less than six hours after eating any type of food, maybe mayonnaise containing food. Clinical findings. Um, first we are going to talk about skin and soft tissue infections caused by Staphylococcus aureus. This occurs due to its spread, the hematogenous spread of the bacteria and it can be due to intravenous drug abusers or surgery. Prior to explaining this, let me tell you that there are three layers of skin. The top one is the epidermis, then we've got dermis, and then hypodermis. When the infection is limited to epidermis and it involves hair follicles, it is called a furuncle. Furuncle is kind of oil. Combination of furuncles will form a carbuncle. If this infection involves dermis along with epidermis, it is termed as cellulitis, and if it only involves epidermis, it is termed as impetigo. If it moves to the lower layers of skin, it will form skin abscesses. Um, skin abscess is actually a sac of pus, which contains um, cellular debris, white blood cells, and bacteria. And now we are going to talk about muscle, bone, and joint infections caused by staph aureus. When the infection spreads to the muscle, it will cause pyomyositis. When it spreads to bones, it will cause osteomyelitis. And when the infection and inflammation involves the joints, it is responsible for causing septic arthritis. Let's talk about bloodstream infections caused by staph aureus. Prior to explaining these infections, let me tell you an important terminology. When bacteria enters the blood or when bacteria is present in bulk in blood, this condition is called bacteremia. When this bacteria along with blood reaches to the brain, it is responsible for causing meningitis, which is the inflammation of the three protective layers of the brain called meninges. And it can also cause brain abscess. If it along with blood reaches to lungs, it is causing pneumonia. And when it reaches heart, it is responsible for causing infective endocarditis. Now we are going to talk about toxin-mediated syndromes of Staphylococcus aureus. First one is toxic shock syndrome, toxin type 1. As we've discussed all the toxin in details in the pathogenesis, we're just going to look at their clinical findings now. On skin, it will cause rash and redness. Blood vessels, it is going to cause hypertension. And from the brain, it is leading to fever. So these three are collectively causing toxic shock syndrome. The scalded skin syndrome is caused by exfoliative toxin, which causes rash, blisters on skin. And there is a positive Nikolsky sign in this disease. And food poisoning, the diarrhea or gastroenteritis is caused by enterotoxin. Lab diagnosis. We'll need sample of skin or soft tissue, blood, sputum, bronchioalveolar lavage fluid, BAL fluid, tracheal aspirates, urine, catheters or prostatic devices because this organism may be present on these devices. Microscopy. As this is a gram-positive bacteria, we know, but at the time of diagnosis, we don't know. So what we'll do, we'll give it a gram Chain, and it will reveal that it is a gram positive cocci. Smears will also reveal grab like clusters, pairs, or short chains. It will be purple colored due to crystal violet stain. As you can see there, it is purple colored due to crystal violet stain. It is spherical, round, or berry like in nature, existing in pairs, short chains, as you can see this one. And it also has certain grape like clusters, just like that. Let's talk about the catalase test. It is confirmed by bubbles formation and it is positive for all the three staph, the Staphylococcus aureus, the Epidermidis, and Saprophyticus. Procedure of catalase test. What happens in that test? We take a petri dish, we put a solution containing hydrogen peroxide, then we put this bacteria into it. If this bacteria converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, and oxygen is responsible for causing bubbles there, then we'll confirm that this is a catalase positive bacteria. But if the bacteria fails to do so, it is a catalase negative bacteria. As you you can see there catalase positive bacteria is forming bubbles in the tube and on the slide as well but the negative is forming nothing the second test we are going to talk about is coagulase test it is confirmed by clumping but it only clumps for staph aureus 
which means that it is positive for Staph aureus and negative for Epidermidis and Saprophytes. Coagulase is prothrombin type molecule, so that's why it converts fibrinogen into fibrin, and fibrin is responsible for clumping. So which bacteria is going to clump up there? Definitely the Staph aureus. If a bacteria clumps up, this test is positive for that bacteria, and if a bacteria fails to clump, this is negative for it. As you can see there, the bacteria who is clumping has got positive coagulase test both on slide and the tube and the bacteria who is not clamping as coagulase negative both in the slide and the tube. Let's talk about the culture. We are going to look at the solid medium. Normally we use mannitol salt agar for that purpose. Colonies will appear round, smooth to slightly rougher wrinkled, raised, golden yellow, opaque with distinct margins. And coagulase positive staph will form yellow colonies. As the staph aureus is coagulase positive, so we are going to have its yellow colonies on the mannitol salt agar. Just like that. These yellow colonies represent what? Staph aureus. Treatment. For treatment, first we'll look at the medicines. Medicines include antibiotics. And in antibiotics, we've got certain categories like methicin insensitive staph aureus MESA. For this bacteria, we are going to use oxicillin and naficillin. For methicillin resistant staph aureus MRSA, we are going to use vancomycin, doxycycline, flindamycin, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. For vancomycin resistant staph aureus, the versa, we are going to use linzolin. Procedures involve drainage, spontaneous, or surgical. If there's a boil, then this procedure is going to be really crucial for that. We also can go for incision and drainage, and removal of catheter, tampon is important important if the cause is related to the long time stay of catheter or tampon in human body debridement of infected site can also help and there is no vaccine because the membrane of staphylococcus aureus is poorly immunogenic prevention prevention involves cleanliness like washing your hands use of antiseptics and also the prompt removal of external devices like tampons nasal packings catheters and surgery lab pads let's do everything really quick. Organism is Staphylococcus aureus, which is responsible for causing certain diseases like toxic shock syndrome, food poisoning, maybe diarrhea is also involved, gastroenteritis, colitis skin syndrome, pyomyositis, osteomyelitis, and septic arthritis. It is also responsible for causing pneumonia, endocarditis, meningitis, and brain abscess. Transmission occurs by hand contact, fomites, when you puncture devices like catheters, prosthetic devices, and maybe tampons or lap pads, nasal pads left in for a long time and surgical wounds. Hosts are the human beings, primary locations are the skin and upper respiratory tract. Diagnosis is confirmed by gram stain and it will be purple because it is gram positive cocci. Microscopy will reveal graph like structures, maybe in short chains or pairs. Culture will reveal yellow colonies, catalase positive and it is also coagulase positive. For treatment, we are going to use oxycillin, vancomycin, linzolate, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxy, along with certain other antibiotics. For procedures, we are going to do incision and drainage and removal of devices like catheters, prosthetic devices, and tampons, nasal packings. And that's it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You've learned something. If you really did, comment down below in the comment section. And also, don't forget to connect with me on my socials. I've got my Instagram, I've got my Twitter, and I do upload vlogs. So if you spare some time, do give it a visit. And I'll meet you in the next video. Assalamu alaikum.